and that he's here. So let's hear. <laughs> Okay, all right. Let's hope that stays. Okay, so, um, so following in the ideas yesterday, I want to do two things. One thing is to give you my view of what is a general setup to think about the problem of inequality. I mean that sort of as a physicist. I mean that I want to create a, a setup that's general, that could go all the way from physics to biology to society, and that speaks to fundamental quantities. But then at the same time, these quantities become instantiated in particular contexts, like in a society, with, under certain circumstances. So I want to show you how I think we can do that. And what that forces you to do is to think of inequality in terms of a component of a process. And that process is the process, effectively, of change and uh, of growth in a society. Growth is basically we think about often as economic growth, as we were discussing yesterday. But I want to also put a lens that's a little wider, you'll see why, that came up yesterday, of human development. What does it mean for society, in some sense, to live better? And that will resonate with some of the ideas yesterday. So, so that will allow us to go from structural inequality, which we measure all the time, to something that's dynamical, that's changing, and therefore opens up possibilities for the future. And then I'll bury you in data. I'll show you lots of data that's spatial, that speaks to what this session's about, which has to do with you know, how these inequalities are expressed and how they're connected to some of these quantities. At the end of the talk, you'll see that we have a lot of work to do to bring these pictures together. But nevertheless, I think that there's a context that's interesting. All right, so I'll skip these things. I study, you know, much, much of what I do today, uh, these days, has to do with studying urban contexts around the world. But you'll see that much of the data that we use is really from cities around the world, big and small, uh, in many different contexts. So it's really exploring the generality of how humans live together that we could uh, actually get to some of these points. Um, this slide I didn't show yesterday, they're sort of my closer collaborators, but there are many more people, um, and I'll highlight them as, as we go. You'll see some of them uh, uh, will be reflected in some of the work I'll show you later. But um, happy group, right? And, uh, and as I said, I'm interested in the problem of development. So let me jump through this. I'm interested in the fact that under certain conditions, I, I like to speak sometimes of situations where a lot is going on, like in a city or in your life, a lot is going on, but nothing happens. You don't have change that's you know, systemic. But uh, if you look for the places that do create change, a lot of these places tend to have to do with, with cities and urbanization. So again, I showed you this Shanghai, 25 years, completely different society. It's easy to see in the built environment, but the most important thing is that people are different and live differently, right? They do different things in their jobs. They eat differently. They have different clothes, everything. Okay. So, and, and just sort of in this, just to situate us with a couple of ideas, I wanted to show you also this, because in many ways inequality has sort of a, 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 a pretty twin, right, which is diversity. So it's the fact that in complex systems in general, not just in human societies, uh, every agent, every organism, every person is actually different, right? This is not true in physics. In physics, every electron is the same, strictly the same. Every, you know, every particle is the same. So the differences in complex systems, in agents, are, become intrinsic. They have to do with how many resources, what information, what's your history. All these things are intrinsic to the agent. And this is fundamentally different. This is both a source of many problems, when you look at it from that side, but also the beginning of everything, right? So Darwin, what was interested in, and I think that this is a nice quote, right? There wouldn't be such thing as beauty if there were no diversity. But it also means that there wouldn't be such thing as ugliness all at the same time, right? So, uh, but the point, you know the problem he was trying to solve, right? He was trying to solve the problem of biodiversity. Where does that come from? Is there a bug or a feature? It's a bug, it's a feature, sorry. But, uh, you know, and, and so diversity and inequality have something to do with each other, and that's tricky. So we need to have diverse societies, diverse complex systems, but at the same time, that creates inevitably 
sources of difference that can be expressed then in inequality. So there's something we need to specify in order to not throw away the baby with the bathwater when we talk about these things. Okay, so development as a process, I think, is, is clear. The, the word itself implies that there's motion that has changed. But I want to talk really uh, in terms of inequality as a process. How is it generated, both uh, enlarged and diminished? And in order to do that, we need to talk about, uh, I used physics-y words, statistical dynamics. But really what I want to do is to think about these processes of growth and development. I'll be clear about what I mean by that in, in a society, but also in some sense uh, implicit in biology. And the program here is quite ambitious because uh, we, we started yesterday with with economists uh, um, that have been interested in the problem of economic growth. And part of the solution to the problem of economic growth, which is sort of a tentative solution, it's more qualitative than it is quantitative today, uh, has to do with the fact that uh, in human societies, we produce new information to use the same amount of resources in different ways and therefore create value. Uh, often this goes under the words of knowledge or technological change but that's seen as the engine of what allows societies to change, right? So we need to get to that and talk about what that means for you and me and as individual agents and how it actually gets aggregated in collectives and into societies. And that program is still to be done and I'll show you it's part of what I mean by creating a general picture. Okay, this also has time scales. So if you think about your, yourself as an individual and any biological organism again, you have a life course, so in fact, that's a curious question, I'm not gonna go there. But you know, why did biology, why did evolution program us to die is, is a very interesting question. Um, but then, of course, there's sort of national development, ideas that we often have in mind when we think about, uh, and Jim uh, had, had those <coughs> ideas in mind, Robinson, about how nations as collectives change. So there are different scales. I'm just throwing some words at you so that you see that we have to do several things at the same time. Okay, so I want to run a thought experiment with you. I kind of mentioned to some of you I was talking yesterday. I do this for my students just to disorient them a little bit. So bear with me. So here's a device we just invented. This is in the spirit of Einstein, who's in the back. It's a thought experiment. And so um, here's sort of a device that measures inequality in a society. I put there an injustice gauge. I'll get to why injustice, but it should be clear already. And I want you to tell me, okay, you're the planner, or you can imagine a society that is different from what we have today. Where should I put it? What's your choice? What's the level? You know Gini coefficients, right? They go between 0 and 1 or 0 and 100. Uh, just to situate you, the United States uh, is something like 0.47. It's seen as a fairly unequal society. Uh, so where should we put it? What's your choice? OK, so let me, let me just show you a few examples. So uh, sorry, it sounds like a game. But this is New York City, it's 0.51. Same as Zimbabwe, quite unequal. Uh, this is income, sorry, or maybe Japan, quite equal, 0.33, more or less. These numbers, you know, they change a little bit every year. Um, so where would you set the Gini meter? 20. 20, okay. I don't think we've ever had any society, large society, with 20. Yeah, yeah. So why 20? Yeah. What would happen? <laughs> oh, <laughs> how do people feel? <laughs> well, 34 sounds pretty good. It's a nice society that exists, right? You know, my point about showing you this is that, you know, it helps a little bit, right? We, we have some reference points. But it's not enough. We have to know what's going on, right? What? 43. Why 43? <laughs> okay, okay, so, so it's kind of hard to know, right? So, so my point is that this is not the right question, right? We can measure it, right? We've been measuring it this way and other ways. But it's not the right question. We've got to know what that means and whether you know, people are living well or not and who's living well or not. Okay, so, so the, the, the first jumping point from just measuring has been this one. This is from a BBC article, but it reflects a lot of literature particularly a different strand of literature that comes more from moral philosophy and development studies and so on, which as you say, as you can see here, I hope, uh, speaks about um, basically the idea that 
it's not just about measuring a Gini, but it's trying to have a sense, and people do have a sense. Anthropologists think of fairness and unfairness, justice and injustice as sort of a human universal. We're very attuned to whether things are fair or not. It seems that in every society we do that. But of course, it's not easy to know. But the point about this is to go from structural inequality, measuring a cross-sectional difference in a society where we don't know really what's going on and how people are living, uh, that we can suspect. But we're bringing effectively those assumptions to, to what we measure to more functional inequality, to think about it's unfair or fair. But then you have to say, unfair or fair for what, right? So the question continues. OK. So what I want to show you now is sort of how I think we can think about this a little bit as physicists. This is from an article I published a little while ago, and this is part of a large program. Uh, it's also sort of in my book. But it's the idea that if you have an agent in complex systems, they have certain general characteristics. So forgive me, I'm going to start very general. And the difference, again, to a physical particle is that an agent in complex systems um, has to have behavior in the world. So it dissipates energy by the, basically, part two first laws of thermodynamics and needs to get energy from the environment in order to survive and get its next lunch and keep going. And it has to have behavior. So that means that the energy that it gets from the environment allows it to exert forces, to exert behavior, so literally consume that energy in terms of behavior. But it needs to be able to do that, and it needs to know what to do with that energy. The moment you have energy or something in your bank account, you have to know what to do with it, right? And so in order to know what to do with it, you need to have information. You have to have a decision about if the environment does this, I'll do that, et cetera, right? <coughs> that is information, literally. And so an agent in complex systems, all agents, this goes back to Schrodinger, many other people at the beginning of life, need to do two things. They need to internalize energy or resources, and they need to internalize information. And they need to express these two things together in terms of agency in order at least to get their next meal. But of course, for people, we do many other things with it. So these two things basically call uh, attention to two quantities. Energy, which we know a lot in physics. All physics is built on energy and its conservation. And then information, which is a somewhat different quantity that we deal less in physics. But it's very interesting because it produces effectively attractive forces between people. It's often good to collaborate with other people that know things that we don't know when together we can do uh, and get resources or do something in the world, write a paper together or not. So, the other element of this is that this all works on a cycle of finite duration. So usually there's a time that we can take to get all the stuff done. So for humans, more or less, the characteristic of time is the life course. How long do we live? Okay? For other systems, it may be less important. Like in a city or a nation, it's not very clear that there's an expiry date. But it's made out, of course, of agents that have that preoccupation. Okay? So this, this allows you to actually write all the stuff in math and so on. And uh, a lot of this program recently uh, this is what Jordan has been working on, several illustrations of this, so I just want to advertise his work. Where is he? No, I don't see him. But anyway, so there it is. Uh, and, uh, but part of the idea is that to get information, you need to learn. To get resources, you need to apply the information well, and you can close that loop and start modeling this in general terms. So what does that look like? So this is kind of the, the simplest thing that you can do. You write this essentially as an equation for, this is the energy conservation equation, right? If you're a physicist, I'm calling it resources, yeah. It's an open system, energy can come in, but, but here I'm just saying that resources, which is energy or money, can change in terms, I'm gonna use more economics language, so there's an income and there are costs, so there's input of energy and output or dissipation, so that's the Y minus C. This actually leads to uh, spatial equilibrium in cities, but in economics becomes a budget constraint, just basically that money is conserved in the short term, or the energy is conserved. So this is what physicists know. But then the new part is that this usually is written in, in finance, in biology, as a growth rate times resources. So the growth rate, as you can see, is the difference effectively between incomes and costs. So if you can accumulate a little bit, you can keep growing. But the idea is, what is that quantity, and where that comes from? Right? This is typically not in a physical system. It's a different kind of dynamics. It's multiplicative. It's naturally exponential. But that quantity usually fluctuates. So it's a stochastic system. And so in the simplest case, this is a geometric Brownian motion. But in fact, in reality, those parameters have structure. And that's where we need to go. So I just want to show you a couple of things that are consequential for inequality from an equation like this. In general, again, that, that, uh, that parameter, the growth rate, can depend on Resources can depend on place, can depend on time. But if it's, if it's approximately a constant, 
The solution is well known. It's a log normal. Here it is at the bottom. Does this, no. so, so there it is at the, at, at, uh, at the bottom. You can integrate it. And what you find is that these three properties, it's the property of that solution. The first one is that the actual growth rate is the average growth rate of that parameter over time, so that is expected, minus the variance of those fluctuations divided by two. This is very familiar to uh, biologists because it means that if you have fluctuations across generations, that subtracts from the growth rate. This is characteristic of multiplicative processes. You don't see in additive processes. And for example, let me give an example. Why is that? If I give you, let's, let's suppose we have 100 euro each, right? And uh, I'm gonna impose a fluctuation on your money. First, it goes down 20%, right? How much money do you have? 80, very good. Now it goes up 20%, so the fluctuations cancel. How much money do you have? Ah, you lost some money. <laughs> so this is this. This is actually, so this actually gives you a drag that multiplicative processes are always losing resources. So they always need to be actually creating a little bit of innovation to make up for it. A little bit of growth, I should say. I'll get to what innovation is. The second thing is that over the long term, um, the growth, the average growth rate over time, which is uh, number two divided by t, is actually a constant of motion because the fluctuations vanish. So if you integrate, so this, these trajectories actually over time become more and more predictable once you take time averages. So they're not identical over itself, similar over time. So that means that growth becomes predictable. If it's non-zero, it becomes predictable over time. And there's a characteristic time in three for that to appear. And that has to do with the magnitude of the fluctuations in these growth rates divided effectively by the growth rate uh, itself. So it's a square. But what this means is that there's a fog of uncertainty. Even if you have a growth process, there's a fog of uncertainty for a while because of fluctuations. And, and, and that depends on how strong these fluctuations are, how much your income and your costs are varying, if you will. And only after a while, this characteristic time scale, can you tell, right? So if the growth rate is very small, you don't know there's growth. So for example, historically, we kind of computed this in various contexts, but uh, even like in the West, in the Roman period, uh, in the Roman Empire, there was a little bit of growth rate for about 200 years, but it's very small. It's about 0.17% is our estimate. So they don't know there's growth. Adam Smith probably didn't know there was growth in modern terms, even though he saw that some societies were richer than others. This is something, we became conscious of this only recently, right? So this is kind of interesting. So this means that people also, that experience a lot of volatility in their lives, a lot of instability in terms of costs and income, they don't know that their resources can grow. They don't have their experience. They don't feel it, okay? And you only feel it over large time scales, over about 10 or 20 years. You're told that economic growth works and so on, but this is not always present. You only feel it over long term. So this has a bunch of consequences about how it's managed, but it becomes a long term problem, okay? So these two parameters that appear in these growth equations have different meanings. So this is more or less where I want to, to go and then move on. There's an average growth rate, as I mentioned, which will be related to information, how you allocate resources. So this is the knowledge you're gonna have on, the, on your context. And there's this volatility that's actually killing you if it's too large. And this actually requires control, requires that you eliminate fluctuations as much as you can. The simplest thing that you can do is just, it's called consumption smoothing, so that you, you basically don't spend all your money when you get money, you kind of save a little bit, and then, you know, when times are bad, you have a little bit in the bank, so you smooth more or less your consumption. That allows you, using your reservoir, and that allows you to do that. But if you're very poor, you can't do that. So you're much, much more subject to fluctuations. This goes for nations and so on. We just went through periods like this. So one of these mechanisms needs control and efficiency, and the other one needs learning. So they are in some contradictions. So we were talking yesterday, for example, societies that experience a lot of instability, they like control. They want control. So for example, uh, you know, we just went through this political cycle where people, some people want more control than before, and with COVID, we had that, right? Whereas uh, you have societies sometimes when everything's going well, they become very open, you know, more democratic societies and so on, and they can grow, but they also become more unstable from the point of view of, of fluctuations over time. And this also has consequences for agents across the population. So I'm just setting this up. So the last part of this is that an agent is composable in complex systems. You can start with people, but then you can have groups of people and cities and nations, right? And then they are working together. And what working together means is that they are, to some extent, pooling their resources and pooling their information, right? They, 
they now act together to write that paper, to run that firm, to whatever that is, right? So this is pooling information together. And information, uh, I wrote this paper a long time ago, but this is well known, uh, is a quantity that actually is not additive, right? It's not equal to the sum of the parts of the information you have and I have, because it can be synergistic, as it's called. So if they're, effectively, if two pieces of information are conditionally dependent on a signal, then you can actually do better than acting individually. So this creates an attractive force, effectively, for people to work together. And you're familiar with it. You do it all the time. This is why we're social. And this is kind of the mystery of humans being social. It's basically grounded on this. But this poses another problem, right? Which is, is it worth it to work with other people? Even, so first, are there potential for good collaborations? But then the mother of all problems is, once we make money together, how is it distributed back to the individuals, right? So, our, so this is the problem of inequality, as Stieglitz says it, is that basically it's organizations, or capital versus labor, and so on, that don't redistribute it back fairly, right? So that the agent may feel that it's not worth it to be part of the organization. So this becomes sort of, so this usually means that you need a social contract to be able to work together, and when this doesn't work, you get people kind of dragging their feet, other people controlling them. You need defection, you may have sabotage, you have migration, people leave, and you may have even revolution. So this is basically all kinds of things that happen when there's unfairness. But, and then you need public agents usually to create some sort of fairness or distribution, which is always imperfect, but that creates sort of a dynamical balancing act. So this is kind of the setup that I'm working with. Okay. So last two things, I know uh, we're going uh, over time, but a little bit uh, with what I want to show you next, but uh, what is the theory of unfairness? So I want to just show you two things. So this is an interesting idea. It goes back to Rouse. This is very influential. It has its jargon, as, as Jaya was telling you yesterday, but it poses that a society that would be fair is a society, this is a structural argument, in which people would not mind swapping roles at random. So I go to Matteo, and we can imagine that if the world is fair, we change places, and I have your life and you have mine, and we're just as happy, right? Or any one of you, so imagine that, right? So most people are poor, so they'd end up you know, maybe better off. The Bill Gates would end up living in a slum in India, and so on, but we would be okay with that society if it was a fair society. What society would you build? So this is, I like to call a preference symmetric invariance in the language of physics, but it means that you don't mind that you basically are permuted with somebody else. So this is his idea. But this, so this is very powerful, and it's still used a lot in ethics. But then Amartya Sen came in, as you heard yesterday from, from uh, Jaya, and the idea is that this should be procedural. It's not just about a structure in which people don't mind changing positions, but it's the ability to do things, to have agency, to use your resources and information to hope to have a better life. So this is where, essentially, this idea of justice is now, conceptually. And it's been operationalized in terms of measuring human development. So I just want to take you there. But this is, this is basically where uh, it's part of a process, a process of becoming who you want to become, if you will, in your context. So the question about unfairness or fairness, equality and inequality, to many people is boiled down to this problem. OK. So I want to show you then uh, now a lot of data. But, uh, but, but first, uh, I want to just emphasize a couple of points that you need to say something about, about function. Inequality, I'm going to show you, is scale dependent when you measure it and applies to many different quantities. So you need a logic. I'll use the logic I gave you. And then you need a standard. Inequality is always a relative quantity. So you need a reference frame. Say, you know, am I compared to a flat distribution or what? And, and so on. So, so just to summarize, for all complex systems, this needs to be specified in context, obviously. But inequality scale dependent applies to many quantities, but there's an organization of these quantities in terms of resources, which can be wealth or energy, in terms of information, there can be strong inequalities of information. It's consequential about who you can become and what you can do, and time. And this is also, of course, you maybe not have resources or information because you don't have access to other people because you're segregated and so on. Okay, so these are three quantities, right? Not, not two, not two. And they work together. They're not a dichotomy. The argument here is that in the most general terms, you need these three things together. So let me show you why. So, so this became actually a measure of human development, uh, completely independently, inspired by Sen's work. But recently, what we did is to localize measures of uh, human development, which are based on quantities like this, 
all the way down to the neighborhood scale. This is where the spatial part of the talk starts. So this is from a recent paper that just came out. And uh, this, uh, this was inspired by the work uh, of Mahmoud uh, ul haq uh, in uh, UNDP, United Nations Development Program. He was a mate of Amartyasins. They had gone to college together at Cambridge, and I, apparently they had conversations. And I think at some point he saw Sand and said, you know, that stuff you're writing is super qualitative. I mean, what you're talking about even. And so he decided to actually operationalize it. And what it, this become, there's a history of this index, but it became essentially the product, so these three things are necessary, of educational, life expectancy, and real income. So you see how this becomes energy in what you can buy locally, knowledge, which is proxied by education, you could, you could argue with that, but it's a proxy, and life expectancy, which is a measure of health, but it's also a measure of your planning window and, and how well you can execute it. And, and so this became an index that's been measured now for over 20 years, maybe 30 years, and ranks countries that became sort of a race to the top of who's better, and you see there at the top a couple of years ago, and the United States is number 17 now in the world. I think it just dropped another set of uh, places in the ranking after this one. And it's number 17 because of inequality, because health and education in the US are very unequal, very local, as you know, and, and that produces better results compared to nations that do better, and the nations that do better are mostly, uh, mostly European and Asian, social democracies, advanced countries. So these mongrel that's neither capitalistic nor socialistic and so on are the countries that are doing better. Okay, so across scales, so trying to do justice to the title of, 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 of what we're trying to do here, you have a distribution, and what you can do here on the bottom is to go from a national picture, which UNDP has been producing for a long time, to smaller scales. So basically because these characteristics are characteristics actually of individuals and households, your education, your lifetime, your, uh, your uh, real income, then you can basically measure them locally, their capabilities of individuals, not nations, right? So you can bring them all the way down to as, long as, as far down as the data permits, and when you open these windows, what you find is extreme inequality at the local scale, right? So there's a map there of Chicago. Chicago is always the proxy child for inequality, I'm sorry. Uh, but what you're seeing here, I don't know, how, oh, sorry, I thought this had a point. Uh, okay, so, uh, I'll show you in more detail in the next slide. But on top, you see that larger cities actually do a little bit better. This is the usual scaling, but actually there's a lot of randomness, partly because we made we took into account costs. But there's also a lot of inequality there on panel E. Okay, And so for Chicago, for example, just to situate you, this is what it looks like. If you don't need Chicago, if you don't know Chicago, you don't need to know. But there's something that we describe as the south side and the west side, which are poor and the north side, which is rich. We can see there uh, in the circle where we live, which is Hyde Park, the University of Chicago. So there's a college town effect. The college towns actually are the paradigm for the places that have the highest human development because they have educated people who also make good health decisions. They tend to live long, and they have decent uh, real incomes. So, uh, but you have places in the city that uh, basically have worse human development than China or Mexico, for example. Uh, and other places that are better than the best countries. So there are extreme inequalities in this way. And these are very local. So across a neighborhood, like you see here for Hyde Park, you go down a block. This is the hospital in the, in the middle. And then uh, you have about 15 years decrease in life expectancy. How did that happen? You know, obviously, that should be something that people should understand. And they're trying to. But they do this very mechanically without this picture of development in mind. And anyway, so you can do this for cities, and here it is, and there are many of these college towns that do well. You can spend time with the data if you'd like. Uh, there's an interactive map that show you the places that create and destroy human development. The pl worst places in the US tend to be jails or asylums and so on, so you have data all the way down to those scales. And what I wanted to show you is just this, which is that if you now look at human development versus almost any other quantity, particularly in the US at the local scale, people have been looking at uh, things that they call neighborhood effects, but things that are here on C have to do with infrastructure, no plumbing, children in poverty, incarceration. Uh, crime is also not here, but we've done it. Uh, meanwhile, teenage pregnancy, which I'm showing you there, uh, people in public assistance, et cetera. For example, uh, measures of health like smoking, disability, poor mental health, obesity. Teeth loss is actually an excellent measure of, of people having problems. Uh, the last one is Raj Shetty's uh, social mobility index. It's a little strange, so I'm not so concerned with it. Uh, 
and obesity seems to be a general problem of the US. It doesn't matter if you have high human development. But, but all of these, basically, as you see in the just a moment, they basically all drop as human development goes up, and basically they go to zero around one, which is the United Nations standard. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yes, much better. Yes, exactly. That's the point. Thank you. Yes. So I call this the Anna Karenina principle of human development. Forgive me if you don't like the metaphor. But the idea is that when you look at those plots here, sorry, I'm not used to this one. When you look at these plots, you see that there's a lot more dispersion at low human development and less dispersion, and better values as well, at low human development. So it's not just that the that, uh, conditions of disadvantage go away, but the uncertainty is much lower. People have much more predictably a good life with no problems. So that's the spirit in which I'm calling Anna Karenina principle of development. We see this also internationally, though the data is not so good is that once people actually have capabilities measured in this way, they have these conditions for development, they basically have no problems. So all, all happy families are the same. But, but the people that have deficits of some of these quantities, they have all kinds of problems. And these problems may be different, and they may be manifest differently. You lose control of your rent, you know, then you're still healthy for a while, you know, but then you can't keep your home, then you live rough, and so on, and then your health is bad. So, Depending on what happens, you have many pathways that create many different problems, but there's a lot more uncertainty as well. So you see that in the data, and you see that on things like financial diaries and so on. So this is one aspect of it that has a very strong spatial neighborhood structure. We've known this for a while, but that now we can start to see globally. So how well am I doing in time? Not so well. Eight minutes. That's not so bad. So this is, there, there are three more things I want to show you, so bear, bear with me. But the second one has to do with the structure in space of quantities. And there's data in the US and increasingly around the world that allows us to see distributions all the way down to very small blocks. And what I want to show you is that some of the objectifications that we do of calling a neighborhood rich or poor, or black or white, which in the US we do a lot, et cetera, are simplistic. What we actually have is a mixture of people at all scales where the mixture shifts. So, you need methods that allow you to characterize, therefore, inequality and distribution across scales and to know what are the effects, for example, of place on these distributions. So this is a little bit like in physics, we like to coarse grain, right? You start with something that's very noisy and you create averages and we hope that that's a good characterization of the bulk effects, right? We're all familiar with this in physics. But we want now to do the opposite. We want to start with a big number on top, like GDP growth or you know, an index of poverty or HDI for a nation. And we want to bring it down to each place. So this is fine graining. And the point is that coarse graining, physicists love it, but you lose information, right? You're kind of averaging stuff out. Whereas when you go like this, you have to put in information. So you start with a general theory of a city or whatever, but then you need a theory of a neighborhood. Why does that neighborhood get to be poorer than the average and so on, okay? So this gives space for people who like theories of particular places like sociology or anthropology often is more local and people that like theories of more average things like economists or physicists. But it means that actually they're working at different scales with somewhat different questions. Okay, so the question that we started with here is that this is a map of New York and it's the uh, greater New York and uh, metro area and it's what you're seeing here is average income. And you always start looking at this, these are block groups, so quite small, about 1,500 people. And so this is a complicated pattern, right? And if you look very carefully, there's some reds in the greens and greens in the reds, so green is rich and red is poor. It's kind of complicated. So what is that? You shouldn't average that, right? People live there. So, okay. So when you look a little bit more in detail, so I'm zooming in just to give you examples, I actually know the distribution of income for, for each neighborhood, so I'm giving you three examples there. So one is uh, this green neighborhood there in the uh, uh, Upper East Side, and you see that most people are very rich, so the one in the middle here. Right? Most people are sort of in the highest income bracket, but there are some people there that are not so rich. This is actually, I'm gonna show you, the most extreme uh, neighborhood in the United States. It's the richest, okay? And then you have one that's all mostly poor, but there are some people there that are middle class, and you have a more mixed one, which is in Queens, okay? So this is kind of the logic of it. But if you average all this and ask, what's the distribution income citywide? It's something people see all the time. It's a, approximately log normal. So each neighborhood deviates, right? from that average and deviates because there's 
you know, we can call it spatial selection because they, you end up with a different concentration of people, sometimes by accident, sometimes because of structural factors. Okay? So the question you can ask is, you know, if I know you live, do I know how much money you make? Right? That's a, that's a question about inequality, but it's also a question about predictability. So it's a question about information, right? Or you can turn around and say, well, if I know your income, can I predict where you live? And turns out the amount of predictability is different in different cities. In some cities, yes, you can. In some other cities, no, not really. You know, there are, people live everywhere. So this tells you how segregated a city is. In this case, by income, you could ask the question about race or any other question. And what this leads you to is to basically methods informed by information theory. There's a long tradition of these methods in econometrics, uh, thanks mostly to Henry Thiel. And these are basically methods that allow you to apportion inequality or dispersion at different scales because they're, they're decomposable across scales. So this is what, and this just follows from the properties of conditional distributions. So I'm gonna go a little bit faster through this, but basically you get filters about, if you're a rich person, where do you live? That's the green. If you're a poor person, where might you live? It's the red. Um, but then you can basically, uh, it follows that you can build these information theoretic quantities that tell you how much predictability the neighborhood structure has on income or vice versa, and how much do the two are related across the city, and that's the mutual information. Okay, so what's the most segregated income group in any city? The rich! Somehow, the rich all end up in the same place. It's nuts. They could live anywhere. They could buy an entire block. But no, they end up in the same freaking place, right? At least in the US. We see this in other places, but this is cleaner. And what's the next most segregated group? The poor. Curious, right? Uh, and then, you know, the least segregated people are middle class people. They more or less can be everywhere. You can imagine them living in a rich neighborhood, you can imagine them living in a poor neighborhood, and so on. So part of what's happening in the US, this is just for a single year, is that we have in the last decade or so, since 2007, fewer people in the middle and more people at the extreme. So everything is getting more polarized, okay? So this is basically the richest building. All these people, crazy people, I mean, would you really want to live with the Koch brothers and, and Nushin and so on? They all live in the same building. And it's stacky, look at that, anyway. All right, so there it is, 7040 Park Avenue. And this basically allows you to say how different each neighborhood is from the overall distribution of the city. So how much information do you need to specify about it to explain how the heck everyone ends up living in the same building? This is not normal. So, so that's the red, but you see that this is also true of neighborhoods that have a lot of poverty concentrated, but also a lot of wealth, okay? And this is basically for the United States. It shows you that different cities have uh, like large cities, but also cities in the south, and, and new cities like the cities of Texas, relatively speaking, are cities that have a, long, a strong alignment of neighborhoods with income versus cities more in the northwest and so on in the purple who have less structure, so people more or less live everywhere. So this is not the same, yeah. Yes, this is uh, American Community Survey data. I'm happy to tell you more, I'll show you the paper. So, so I just want to finish in my missing few minutes uh, by showing you a bit of a similar picture uh, going internationally. So this is now a study of Brazil and South Africa, and then I'll finish with our Africa-wide study that's just coming up. But basically, we did the same thing, not with income, though we did income too, but with services, access to services. This is South Africa. It's a study for South Africa and Brazil, but it has some of the same characteristics. These inequalities of who gets service and who doesn't. So you see here, basically, this is going to be water, sanitation, decent houses, and so on, um, is very local. So this is Johannesburg. So you see that the purple, everyone has services, and the blue, people don't have services. But also, if you measure the inequality at different scales from the neighborhood, where it's more homogeneous, to the city, a metro area is very heterogeneous, to the nation, you basically that see that uh, inequality is scale dependent. So you have to be careful. When you say Gini blah, you have to say at what scale, for what, et cetera, okay? So this is just warning you. Okay, so what you see, I'm kind of going faster, is that if you, if you measure the access by neighborhood uh, to, to services, and across each city you also measure the standard deviation, which is a measure of inequality, a very simple one, you tend to have this diagram, that as you have more access, there's also more inequality for a while, and then when everyone has access, obviously inequality has to go down. So this is like a Kuznets curve for, uh, for, for services, for things that people in the end uh, 
become universal access services, but for a while, as you start servicing people, this basically happens. They create more inequality. So this didn't need to happen. You could just basically service each neighborhood the same way. That would be the equality line. But there's also a maximal inequality line where you basically um, do it in a way that, that is concentrated. So, so this is what you always see. But this predicts a certain pattern of inequality as something gets distributed in the population. So it's kind of interesting. This is the end of that story, but it shows you that in South Africa, where I was showing the first plot, as services become more and more universal, which you see there on, the, on my left, on your right, you will see that inequality is coming down. This is because everyone is getting, getting water, right? So this is good. So this happens a lot. There's something coming through. At first, it goes to places, depending how it's distributed, it goes to places that are better prepared or richer or have more power. But if it's going to be universal service because it's mediated by public investment and so on, in the end, this is good. Okay. So the last question is, if we understand all this sort of scientifically, meaning it's predictable, it's quantitative, we have a model for it, we expect how it develops over time, can we actually accelerate it? and make it better so that you know, these inequalities don't stand for so long. People expect there'll be a period of growing inequality, but we're getting there, you know, all kinds of things. So this is a, a long-term study of slums, of neighborhoods that don't have, uh, that typically informal, don't have infrastructure, but, uh, but that we've come to understand in terms of uh, what they look like spatially. We use a lot of spatial data, high precision, as I'll show you. And then uh, the idea is that there are ways to deliver those services that are actually better, they're more incremental, uh, and more respectable people in the place history than has been done in the past with urban scaling, with urban um, planning. So, so this is kind of a, a large program, and we're in the middle of releasing a bunch of papers that include data for an entire sub-Saharan sub, uh, uh, sub African continent. The first time we have every building for Africa from high-precision remote sensing is just a revelation to see how these cities are put together, how they're growing how a lot of it is having in peri-urban zones and so on. But this relies, for, if you're a data head like me, this is Chicago, but it's like th what you see here, it's Google Earth, is a 3D model of a city. I live there. Uh, but it's now, this is becoming possible as a mixture of high-precision remote sensing, AI models, and so on, that basically are creating complete replicas of, of, of the space of cities. And this is being done, this is an example for South Africa, also for informal areas. So you see, you, you can see the tires and so on there, right? But this is kind of a recreation of each building. This is not done at scale yet. But it's kind of interesting, and the data for each footprint is now created at scale. So, and this is part of, for us, it was part of a big survey that we did with nonprofits, uh, this nonprofit called Slum Dwellers International, which are communities trying to foster their own development by creating data about that deficit. So they want to show you this actually started in India and Mumbai, but spread and it's very prominent now in many African countries. The idea is that by creating local data, you can show the authorities that you have lack of certain services, and the idea is that you can influence the process by being better than the authorities that are creating evidence. Okay, so this is the kind of evidence you get, but it's very varied, and a lot of it informs, you know, gender issues, for example. Women tend to be the ones that have to carry water, or are more insecure when there's no sanitation. There are a bunch of other issues like that. So when you visit these places, what you find is that often when you don't have services, you don't have street access. So this is a community in, uh, in Old Fadama in, in Accra, uh, basically where people made streets so that you have access. And along the streets, as you kind of see here, there are toilets and so on, which they don't exist in the houses where people live because they don't have access to the water and sanitation lines. So this is a place, this uh, Fuzini is this guy standing here is the boss and he's a super charismatic guy. And he's showing us how they had this problem, they had to solve it, but basically they created a street network. And so what we, we took this idea to, to town, and basically, it's a longer story, but here's an example from India. Uh, here's an example from South Africa, again, where you have the same thing. The city is delivering services, but where the streets touch the neighborhood, but the neighborhood itself doesn't have services for the houses inside. And, but the community center, which is, of course, created by the community, is in the most central place. Mm -hmm. So you see kind of, it's also the bar. Uh, but you, know, you see sort of the contradiction here, right? It's not like a city that we're used to living in where each one of our houses, you walk to the street and you have services and you have an address and so on. So this is spatially, that's the nature of the problem. And it's the problem of topology. I won't to, spend time on this, but it goes back to Euler. It's a beautiful story and so on. Uh, okay, so uh, you can kind of come to uh, characterize essentially the spaces of cities and identify parcels within each block surrounded by streets that are kind of internal and have levels of being internal and this allows you to identify from spatial data this kind of problem of access to streets. So we're using this a lot. 
And this gives you a measure of spatial inequality and then how you could extend the street network in blue in order to provide access. So this is excruciatingly spatial, right? But then you can zoom out and start creating what, what are the places at the neighborhood scale, each block, that have services or not? How is this distributed? You know, fractions of the population is very practical, but it also speaks to what we're doing here. So this is a city of Freetown, Sierra Leone, and you see that most people actually have a little bit of deficit, and then there are a few neighborhoods here in yellow, which tend to be more rural or in town, hills and so on, that have kind of extreme situations. But the extreme slums, they're very dense and so on, are actually rare when you do this at scale. They're the ones that cap capture the imagination. But a lot of the deficits and inequalities are mild. They're not extreme, at least for most of the population. This is a very famous place that's getting a lot of attention now. It's called Mokoko. It's, the, as they call it, the Venice. You can see that the boats, this is built over the water on stilts. It's in Lagos, supposed to be the largest city in the world. And so you can do this for every city and at scale and so on. So you see all this inequality, how it's being mitigated through the delivery of services, where it's bigger and smaller, and, and so on. So that's it. So let me just finish with this slide which is basically that when you look at the problem of inequality, of distribution, of difference, of diversity, scale is, ever, is important, quantity is important. But all this tends to be grounded on the ability of people to exert their own agency, to be resilient, and so on. And so a lot of this depends on individuals and households and communities being able to do that. It's grounded on people. So this idea of processual inequality of human capabilities is very important. But that all is mediated by the city and the larger governments at larger scale. So this is where basically these scales interact and the mechanism by which things are created and mitigated matter and they have social contracts at various scales. So all this matters for this problem and its solution. Um, if you have interest in seeing more of this, there's a book. But I want to uh, just, just say one last thing, which is that a lot of what we can do today with this kind of data is structural. We can see these inequalities. And we have now this idea that we need to create improvements over time in terms of agency. But there are another kind of uh, diversity which has to do with the potential for growth. Uh, cities and ecosystems and other systems need to create ambient diversity as sort of a capital for future growth, for future solutions, and so on. And so if we don't do that, it's not only bad for people involved, which is often the way we measure unjustness uh, or injustice, but it's bad for the system because eventually it will not grow, produce value, produce its future. So there's also the agency of the, of the ensemble versus the agency of the individual. And these things are connected and therefore need to be connected in terms of costs and benefits. So that problem is back to that collective problem, the mother of all problems in terms of, of inequality. It's accessing the long-term improvements and reflecting that on individuals that becomes key. So thank you. Okay, so things changed. Um, so the idea now is that we're going to have uh, like, uh, some minutes for discussion now, and then have the coffee break, and then we have the, the presentation. Okay, so any questions to Luis? Any questions? I can work, yeah, that's, that's my job. Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure we need the microphone. Maybe we can, well, it doesn't matter. Well, thanks, Luis, for the talk. Um, so I was wondering, given that you have looked at so inequalities in different aspects, so I lived not in Chicago, but very close to Chicago for a few years. And, and I went back a few years, I mean, well, last year I was there. And to my surprise, I saw there was like a, biking lane, which was unthought of when I was living there, because it's always full of cars. So I was wondering, have you looked at inequalities in this sense, in adaptations to more sustainable methods of transport in cities? I mean, I, I mean now, you know, every major city has like, well, I don't know if every major city, but many major cities have biking lanes, like different types of um, 
they have reduced some of them, like lane, car lanes, in just to facilitate like mobility of people. And I was wondering, have you looked at this and how this? I'm sure there are inequalities about this too, but I haven't seen anything about it. So no, wondering. there's there's work that's coming up, but uh, the, this infrastructure, as you as you were describing, is happening in many cities, sort of gradually. So, but it has a lot of the same signatures that you see in the in the provision of services. It happens locally first, so there's injustice about or inequality about who gets their bike lane and who doesn't, right? And then its advantage becomes with scale when you can go everywhere from anywhere in a city on a bike, which most American cities at least are not there. If you go to the Netherlands or Copenhagen, you can do that. But, but those, those are systems, I've been studying those systems actually, uh, that have been there for 20, 30 years that became large systems with all kinds of other things. So. Uh, so now, uh, part of the problem actually we're studying is that the initial development of these lanes actually are dangerous for the cyclists to some extent. So even though it feels like a good thing, as you're saying, uh, because they're incomplete and because the drivers are not educated and they're often not done to the highest standards, it gives the cyclist a sense of security and, 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 and agency, and then the car's still there in some other way. So, so the initial... So I, I wanted to characterize this kind of thing, thank you for asking, in terms of, again, some sort of Kuznets curve, where at first the provision actually makes things worse, <laughs> possibly, but eventually, so that should not be a reason to start because the advantages come at scale. Uh, so I think that that's part of the problem. The same, you know, similar thing with a very different example like electric cars. Electric cars, in, mostly in the US, but I think it's true in other places too, uh, are expensive. And, and the tax breaks that you get typically go to richer households. So, you know, they're trickling in as, as it goes. So even though it's a good thing for society, they're my, primarily something that's creating inequality for now. Hi, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, since you were talking neighborhoods and inequality and you also brought up Chicago, I was just wondering, um, I'm not a physicist, by the way, but I was just wondering if your models or you interact with or take into account some of the historical social spatial effects of policies like redlining, for example, which um, restricted people of color from accessing home loans and have been shown to kind of have multi-generational effects. Or in South Africa, for example, the extreme segregation which was imposed by the apartheid state. I was just wondering if you've been able to engage with some of these maybe uh, historical policy effects? Uh, the answer in general is yes, but uh, we, we've had actually a couple of super talented postdocs in our group and in our institute that do exactly that. Um, I think what we see, most of the studies that I see now are the persistence of these historical policies and circumstances into the present, right? And how they may be mitigated or not. Most, most of the time there is, depending on place and so on, but a relatively strong presence of those patterns of still racial segregation, of lower quality housing or whatever, in places that received redlining and so on. Uh, there are exceptions. There are places that have changed since then, both in South Africa and the US. So depending a little bit on the local history and what your interest is on. But there are these historical injustices for sure. Uh, one interesting aspect of neighborhood inequality related to this is that when you think about the time scale for the character of a neighborhood to change, you know, it's socioeconomic status, it's racial, ethnical composition, and so on. It's at least decades. And when you think about that, in the United States, more or less, every household moves every five years. So a neighborhood, you know, actually has a lot of churn. There's a lot of local movements and so on. But somehow its character persists. So they become a place that, because of their characteristics, tend to attract for a while, unless there's something that happens, the same type of population, sometimes uh, channeling that continued disadvantage. So I think people, have these sort of ecological effects, as sometimes sociologists, certainly in Chicago talk about it, are just starting to be studied. But I think we've had uh, challenges studying them long longitudinally over time, over these time scales. But this is coming. But definitely there are these persistent injustices. I think part of the question has been, are they changing or not? And what's the right mechanism to address them in terms of compensation, but also creating better local conditions? I mean, in some sense, as you can see, what needs to be done is to create uh, a decent living standard everywhere, both individual level and at a place level. And that has just not happened, even though there are mandates to do that. 
Thanks for the talk. Oh. So no, I have just a technical question. So uh, going back to this uh, multiplicative growth uh, model. So, uh, so in this model, essentially, you have these two parameters. So the average uh, growth rate, uh, the drift and diffusion. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But what happens is uh, uh, when you uh, when you introduce uh, redistribution or interaction between individuals, mm -hmm. then uh, essentially the growth rate is independent of the diffusion of sigma. Uh, yeah, they're independent uh, parameters. And yeah. actually you have a strange effect uh, that uh, the larger is sigma, the more equal is the inequality is inversely proportional to, to sigma. So how, I don't know how, how this fits with your yeah. with this. No, so, so your first point is correct, and it was also part of the point I was trying to make, is that in general, the average and the variance of volatility the, are independent parameters. What needs to be done and has received less attention and sort of what we're doing is what is the theory of these parameters? Where do they come from? So endogenize them if you want. And, and, and so it's not just about, so uh, most models of redistribution, they redistribute resources, but in the logic that I try to propose, you also th may think about redistributing information effectively so that the growth rates equalize or, or are more less evenly distributed. So our first paper is about that. But, but you have to address these two quantities and their origins uh, independently in general and then to what extent they are also interdependent. And that's a lot of the work that, in my view, remains to be done. Is is sort of you know, it's the theory of the parameters, not of the short-term dynamics. Yeah. Hi. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you for your presentation. And I'm not going to use the mic because I will be deaf in the second, so I will raise my hand for my voice. Um, So, the, so the, as you say, the, um, so two things. On, on the one hand, there's sort of the human part, where you can imagine the idea, the idea essentially of, of a metropolitan area is that people in general could, I'm, I'm addressing your point, but could in principle think about living anywhere. It's a shared real estate market and, and labor market. But in practice, as you're pointing out, and I was pointing out by you before, people are constrained in many different ways, right? Uh, the, Arguably, the biggest constraint uh, in modern cities in the U.S. is not so simple, but bear with me, is is real estate, right? That real estate is is in incredibly varied in terms of price, and obviously, poorer households cannot live in very expensive real estate. In that building, actually, is a co-op, which basically is a club. You need to be approved by the board. I mean, there are many buildings like this in large cities in the U.S., and this has obviously been also a racial thing, but also a class thing, and so on. You need to show you have. Uh, I think 100 million in assets, at least, to be in that building. It's a private thing. It's like you know, still redlining of a sort. Uh, but there are many, many uh, obstacles of this sort. Uh, the obstacles typically are contravened to some extent, but incompletely by by public action, by services, 
you know, sometimes rent controls, things that kind of come from the political process more. But they're always imperfect, right? There's always a rat's race, uh, you know, uh, um, an arms race to, to try to keep the city balanced and other mechanisms particularly to do with economics uh, and sometimes segregation, racism, to actually keep the city separate. So that's the problem. I think we're more conscious of them. We have better data. We can see actually, you know, in distribution, not so much the individual, but in distribution by characteristics, how neighborhoods are changing. But it's hard to intervene in, in most cases at that level and know what the right thing to do is. But I think that's an excellent question. If you had all this data and you see each neighborhood move and so on and the quality of life and the people that are there, what would you do? Uh, and I, I think to a large extent, it goes back to the ideas by Rawls and others, right? That you want to make sure that the amenities, the conditions of real estate and so on, even for people who are poorer or most excluded, are, are decent and enabling of their capabilities. If that's true, then we're already in a better place. And then you can sell expensive things to rich people. But if that's not true, if that actually is a ghetto, a disadvantage, or a segregated neighborhood, then that's a major problem. So again, I think you have to ask that question along with uh, structural questions. But, but it's, there's work to be done that I think we understand better functionally, but that in the public realm in, of policy is very hard still. Yeah. So interestingly enough, we are on time. So let's thank <laughs> I don't know how, how Luis <laughs> for the presentation, and then we go for the coffee break, and then we are back, and then we have more discussions and more questions. Okay, thank you. Thank you.